This webinar is brought to you through a partnership uh, between the Central Rockies, HETC, SAMHSA, and HRSA, all in Region 8. Okay. The ATTC network, just to give you some idea, is funded by SAMHSA and includes 10 regional centers across the nation, of which we are in the Central Rockies, Region 8, and housed at the Utah Addiction Center at the University of Utah. It also includes four national focus areas. I want to move on just very quickly to, so we can get to the webinar, just to some basic housekeeping issues. Um, so if all participants, uh, we could ask to do the following. If all participants could mute um, your microphone for the duration of the webinar. For best sound quality, please use the call-in number provided rather than the speakers on your computer. Technical, any technical problems during the webinar, you can contact uh, one of our contacts here at our office, which is Shannon Christensen. Her email is shannon.christensen at utah.edu. Or we also have a toll-free number, which is 855-801. 4237. You can use the, ch the chat feature at the bottom of the screen to ask questions during the presentation. If time permits, we'll be able to answer some questions during the presentation. However, any, any questions will be answered in a follow-up email in addition to anything we're able to answer uh, during the webinar, after the webinar is completed. The webinar will be recorded today, and a URL link, URL link uh, will be posted to our Central Rockies ATTC website by September 1, 2015. In addition, a copy of today's PowerPoint presentation is in the handout section on your webinar toolbar that you should be able to see on your computer. Um, instructions for how to complete the post-webinar test and to receive continuing education credit is in the handout section on your webinar toolbar is also available through the Central Rockies ATTC website under Continuing Education. The other thing I want to point out is this, this is the first webinar in a five-part series addressing opiate and prescription drug misuse. That will start today and continue for the next four consecutive Wednesdays at the same time. In order to participate in the remaining webinars, please make sure to register for each of them online if you haven't already done so. Now it's my pleasure uh, to be able to turn the time over to Dr. Charlie Smith, who is the Region 8 um, SAMHSA Administrator. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Thank you very much, Jason, for the kind introduction. Uh, I am Dr. Charlie Smith. I'm the Regional Administrator for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, specifically the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration here in Denver. And I'm thrilled that you have joined the Region 8 Public Health Learning Series entitled Strategies to Address Opioid and Prescription Drug Misuse. As Jason indicated, this is a five-part webinar series brought to you by a collective effort of the Central Rockies Addiction Technology Transfer Center and the Denver Regional Offices of the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And I'd also like to specifically um, honor and recognize the contributions for Dr. Christina Mead as well as Dr. Kim Patton in developing this program. The overall goal of this five-part learning series is to increase our knowledge and practical skills related to safe clinical practice guidelines for prescription medications. Also, it's focused on the clinical treatment of addictive disorders and the use of naloxone for opioid overdose. Today is our kickoff presentation, which is focused on defining the scope of prescription drug abuse. Prescription drug abuse and addiction are significant public health issues impacting our patients, our families, our communities, as well as our clinical practice outcomes. According to the 2013 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which SAMHSA conducts annually, 6.5 million people reported non-medical use of prescription drugs in the past month. The majority of them, 4.5 million, reported non-medical use of pain relievers. And more than 1.5 million people reported initiating non-medical use of pain relievers. And this is second only to those reporting initiation of the use of marijuana. Medical emergencies involving opioids have increased 183% between 2004 and 2011. And in 2011, 1.2 million ER visits involved non-medical use of prescription medications. 
looking specifically at Region 8, which includes Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. Region 8 has one of the highest levels of, of drug poisoning deaths in the U.S. We are also one of the lowest numbers of opioid treatment programs and credentialed providers of buprenorphine and Suboxone for the treatment of opioid addiction. Today we have three fabulous speakers. They're national experts and key leaders in the fight against opioid addiction and pres prescription drug misuse. And they're going to set the stage for the next four sessions. First, we have Rear Admiral Dr. Deborah Parnham Hobson, who is a Senior Advisor for HIV and AIDS Policy and the Acting Chief Public Health Officer for the Health Resources and Services Administration, which is part of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She will be talking about national significance of opioid abuse in the United States, as well as the prevalence of prescription drug misuse. Then we'll have Dr. Melinda Campopiano, who is the Medical Officer and Branch Chief of Regulatory Programs for the Division of Pharmacotherapies, Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, um, for SAMHSA, which is part of the U.S. Department of Public Health Services, uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And she's going to talk about federal initiatives as well as provider resources for prescription drug abuse. And then finally, we'll have Dr. Chris Stock, who's a clinical pharmacist for substance abuse programs and clinical associate professor of the pharmacy service as well as mental health pharmacy at the George E. Whalen VA Medical Center in Salt Lake City. And he'll be talking about the physiology of opioid exposure. So with this, I am very pleased to pass on the baton to Dr. Um, Deborah Parnham Hobson. Thank you, Dr. Smith. And welcome everyone to this first in a series of webinars. The abuse of and addiction to opioids is a serious and challenging public health problem. Deaths from drug overdose have risen steadily over the past two decades and have become the leading cause of injury death in the United States. The Obama administration's inaugural National Drug Control Strategy, published in 2010, charted a new course in our efforts to reduce illicit drug use and its consequences in the United States, an approach that rejects the false choice between an enforcement-centric war on drugs and drug legalization. Science has shown that a substance use disorder is not a moral failing, but rather a disease of the brain that can be prevented and treated. Informed by this basic understanding, the strategies that followed promoted a balance of evidence-based public health and safety initiatives focusing on key areas such as substance use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery. The 2014 National Drug Control Strategy, released this year in July, builds on the foundation laid down by the administration's previous strategies and serves as the nation's blueprint for reducing drug use and its consequences. The strategy is informed by science and represents a 21st century approach to drug policy. The strategy is based on four broad areas. Number one, preventing drug use before it begins. Number two, intervening early before a medical condition becomes chronic. Three, making access to treatment a reality for millions of Americans, and four, eliminating barriers to recovery. Each of these topics will be explored in much greater detail during this webinar series. So what is the state of prescription drug abuse in the United States today? Prescription drugs, especially opioid analgesics, have increasingly been implicated in drug overdose deaths over the last decade. From 1999 to 2013, the rate for drug poisoning deaths involving opioid analgesics nearly quadrupled. Deaths related to heroin have also increased sharply since 2010, with a 39% increase between 2012 and 2013. Given these alarming trends, it is time for a smart and sustainable response to prevent opioid abuse and overdose and treat people with opioid use disorder. Mortality data show that there was a 6% increase in drug overdose deaths between 2012 and 2013. 
and approximately 37% or 16,235 of the overdose deaths involve prescription opioids, a number essentially unchanged from 2012. However, the mortality rate from heroin overdose each increased each year from 2010 to 2013. So what are we doing about this? In March of this year, Sylvia Burwell, who is the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, announced a targeted initiative aimed at reducing prescription opioid and heroin-related overdose, death, and dependence. The Secretary's efforts focus on three priority areas that tackle the opioid crisis, significantly impacting those struggling with substance use disorders and helping to save lives. Those three areas, the first is provide training and educational resources, including updated prescription guidelines to assist health professionals in making informed prescribing decisions and address the overprescribing of opioids. The second area, to increase the use of naloxone, as well as continuing to support the development and distribution of the life-saving drug to help reduce the misuse and abuse, including $133 million in new funding to address this critical issue. So who in our communities is at risk for prescription drug abuse? Existing evidence shows that individuals at greatest risk for prescription opioid overdose include white and American Indian and Alaska Native people, men, although overdose among women is on the rise, people living in rural areas. We certainly note a cluster in the southeast, especially in the Appalachia region. Adults age 45 to 54. People who obtain multiple controlled substance prescriptions from multiple providers. And people who take high daily doses of opioid pain relievers. These are the groups that have been found to be most at risk. In addition to mortality, other types of adverse health events tied to prescription opioid abuse have increased over the last decade. And as Dr. Smith mentioned earlier, rates of emergency department visits associated with pharmaceutical misuse or abuse increased 114% between 2004 and 2011. In 2011, more than 1.4 million emergency department visits annually were due to the misuse or abuse of pharmaceuticals with 420,000 involving prescription opioids and 425,000 involving benzodiazepines. The admission rate for substance abuse treatment for prescription opioid abuse in 2009 was almost six times the rate in 1999. Prescription opioid abuse can also result in other health consequences, such as neonatal abstinence syndrome, increased risk of transmission of HIV and hepatitis C, and fractures in older adults due to falls. With all of these challenges, there are some strategies that work to address this epidemic. We can help health professionals to make the most informed prescribing decisions, including teaching medical professionals how and when to prescribe opioids, supporting data sharing and safe prescribing, and increasing investments in state-level prevention interventions to track opioid prescribing and support appropriate pain management. We can also increase the use of naloxone, and we can expand the use of medication-assisted treatment. This five-part webinar series will provide you with more in-depth information 
and strategies that you can use to address the growing problem of prescription drug abuse. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good afternoon. Um, this is Melinda Campos Cano. Is it a? Uh, I'm not sure if uh, someone's supposed to segue here. Well, not hearing anything further, and uh, giving the impression that you all can hear me. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just uh, provide the brief overview of the several initiatives and provider resources that uh, we have available to you. Oh, thank you for the title slide. Um, so I thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you at the beginning of this very important series. I hope that by providing um, a little bit of a overview at this time, it will help you make sense of the various federal activities uh, that from the outside can seem uncoordinated. Uh, but believe it or not, are actually coordinated and help you identify resources that are available to you at the federal level to implement change in your clinical practice and deal with system and uh, patient provider level barriers that you may encounter uh, as you try to move through um, uh, your response to this public health problem. So the slide that you have in front of you, um, I'm going to pick up where Dr. Hopson left off regarding the Secretary's initiative. Um, a lot of significant activity was going on at the federal level prior to the issuance of this initiative in the spring. But the scope of the public health problem became, just seemed to continue to expand. So what the Secretary did was try to take this and organize it around the guiding public health principles and target what are the most meaningful outcomes we'd like to produce for people uh, at risk of opiate use uh, disorder or harm from opiate use, such as overdose. So the two problem areas are uh, overdose and overdose-related mortality and the prevalence of opioid use disorder. These are going to be the areas that, um, as, a, as a department, we'll be attempting to measure. Uh, our impact. If you'll go on to the next slide, uh, Dr. Hobson uh, mentioned the three focus areas. Basically, it's safe prescribing, uh, expanded use of naloxone, and um, expanded access to medication-assisted treatment, which is a very effective uh, method of preventing not only overdose fatalities, but harms related to overdose. So. Um, Go ahead to the next slide. I'm going to jump right in on the first area of activity, which is what is the federal government doing around opioid prescribing practices. Um, now, prior to this initiative, there was FDA's REMS Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy that provides uh, continuing medical education to all sorts of health professionals regarding the use of long-acting and extended release um, opioids. So this is something that anyone who has a, a DEA registration and is prescribing these or might prescribe these medications are encouraged to take. And FDA provided guidance about what, what such training should cover and has professional societies that do nothing but train physicians and PAs and nurse practitioners. Um, providing this training. Um, now, so that's one thing. And then NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, has had a very long process going on in which they've developed a national pain strategy. And what they've looked at most closely is how are we, um, uh, or what do we actually know about how to use opioids for chronic non-cancer pain? So a kind of pain that somebody may live with for an extended period. Does it work? Does it not work? Turns out the basic finding is that we don't really have the evidence to say for sure. But as a result of this evidence process and public discussion and public input, NIDA will be releasing its national pain strategy um, probably in the fall. 
And I think that's an important document that you should uh, look out for. Now, um, if you move on to the next slide, this is a newer activity that's just getting started that I wanted to highlight. Um, because it's getting some attention, I wanted you to see where it fits in. Um, so this is money that CDC is um, making available to states. And it will be prioritized according to uh, the uh, risk and burden of prescription drug misuse and overdose in given states. So it's risk-based. And what's particularly interesting is that it's going to be connected to some enhancement of the prescription drug monitoring program. Now, each state gets to decide, you know, within a certain range what those enhancements might be. But um, interoperability, um, a single login, embedding it in medical records, these are all the types of things that a state might do to try to um, increase the utility of their prescription drug monitoring programs um, in terms of promoting patient safety. So make it more of a useful tool and not so much of a got you kind of thing. Um, now I think if you'll go on to the next one. The other big activity, and this one is another CDC activity, uh, is the development and publication of a clinical guideline for um, decision making in chronic pain outside of end of life care. So this is the chronic pain population that, that NIDA was focusing on. And CDC is going to sort of operationalize their strategy into a clinical document that providers can use. And it really should be of interest to people who are not necessarily prescribing pain medication, but maybe counseling patients as to the role of pain medication in their uh, management of their condition or in the safe storage of it at home. So it should be of, of fairly broad interest. Um, the other thing that, that's interesting is that CDC has kind of built into this process is the possibility that they may be able to make this into not exactly an algorithm, but more of a decision support tool that could be built into health um, IT. So your electronic health record may have some, some of the guidance from CDC embedded in the process that the prescriber uses to order an opioid. So that could be um, really, you know, at the, at the moment of decision making uh, support, uh, which is kind of exciting. Um, <laughs> Maybe I'm a little bit of a geek, but it's kind of exciting. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about um, naloxone. Now, um, AMSA released uh, its toolkit for overdose prevention, but a, a, a big feature of which is the role of naloxone. Um, that came out uh, about two years ago. We've actually updated it once since. And um, recently, uh, July 1st and 2nd, to be exact. Uh, FDA sponsored a national meeting on the uptake of naloxone. So they're looking towards sustainability and expansion. Now that the general science behind the role of naloxone in reversing opioid overdose in the community has been accepted, we're looking at what are the models that should be disseminated. Um, so something exciting that's sort of in the pipeline is that there are um, formulations of naloxone in development that um, they're, they're being considered for expedited approval um, that are specifically designed to be administered uh, by spraying them into the nose. Because right now what's happening is that people are administering naloxone intranasally, but they're actually just kind of spraying in the injectable formulation. And that kind of works, but it is so liquid, so it doesn't stay there on the nasal mucosa as well as you might like. There's definitely some safety and added benefits we had by having an appropriate formulation. The other thing would be to have an FDA approved device for intranasal use specifically designed for this purpose instead of kind of adapting something that's for spraying something else into the nose. Um, now, so that's all coming up. And I'm excited because I'm looking forward to updating the toolkit uh, to reflect the new um, uh, formulations and uh, methods of administration that, that will be FDA approved. Um, and then, of course, there is uh, HRSA, which is re recently made grants to make uh, naloxone and related training available in 
specifically in rural areas. I think it's their rural access to medical devices. I may not quite have the name of that bureau right, but so they're working on that already. And then um, other sources of funding are being developed through different agencies within HHS to try to support communities and organizations being able to purchase naloxone, um, which seems to be kind of the, the rate limiting step at the moment. Now, if you'll go on, I'll talk a little bit about medication-assisted treatment with the next slide. Um, we have 40, 45 years of evidence that medication-assisted treatment, initially in the form of methadone, subsequently in buprenorphine, and now with extended release injectable naltrexone, is effective at uh, reducing drug use, reducing criminal behavior, promoting abstinence, promoting access to recovery. Um, we have more evidence about the older forms of medication, the methadone and buprenorphine, with regard to actually reducing mortality, reducing HIV infection, and reducing um, uh, or improving compliance with medical therapy. So um, there's a, a really it's an opportunity to intervene quickly and effectively with people by taking advantage of this tool of medication-assisted treatment that's just sitting there waiting for us to implement on a bigger scale. So I hope as you're listening and learning about this problem, you'll look for opportunities to include that type of service in uh, your program. Now, um, I want to highlight, if you go on to the next slide, because uh, I want to be respectful of time here, um, that uh, SAMHSA uh, is uh, getting close to releasing a uh, award of funds to 11 states. So they'll be getting um, close to a million dollars a year, each year for three years. We are expecting at this point to fund another round of, of states in uh, fiscal year 2016, hopefully 11 more. And then um, we hope, we don't know yet, if we'll have the opportunity to do that again in 2017. So this is fund for states to collaborate with agencies and providers in the areas of highest need in their state to expand access to MAT. And that may be by by directly providing medication, but it also may be providing recovery support services to those people who uh, are using MAT and could get greater benefit for it if their care is more comprehensive and better coordinated. So this is very exciting because um, SAMHSA doesn't fund a lot of direct services that much, particularly in medication-assisted treatment. So we're excited to potentially be able to uh, identify some more effective models that we could disseminate. And so coming years, this will also be need-based. So we'll be ranking, uh, you know, the states that can apply for this will be the ones of highest need, and there'll be a sort of preferential award to these states would be um, based on the extent of the need and the severity of the problem and the rapidity with which it's growing in a given area. So now, um, the, and we're, uh, I would suggest to keep your eyes peeled for other um, uh, state and community level funding opportunities around medication assisted treatment. And um, it, it, I, I think it's an area that we, we could all uh, do a little bit better on as far as our public health uh, response to this problem. Now I'm going to move in, if you go to the next slide, to um, talk about some specific resources that I want to highlight. Um, uh, SAMHSA supports um, two different provider clinical support systems. One is for um, uh, providers and prescribers of opioids, and one is targeted for prescribers of medication-assisted treatment. Now, obviously, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, people with addiction who are on medication-assisted treatment have pain and need pain management. People with pain who are receiving opioids for pain have problems with addiction. So that's why we, we kind of have them uh, knit together a little bit under one roof here. Um, so this is a particularly useful way, place to find information around um, those people that kind of fall into both groups or, or may fall into both groups. Um, go on to the next slide because on this slide I provide you with the, the web addresses for our two provider clinical support systems. You can get free continuing medical education or continuing education credits there. There are live webinars that 
provide you the opportunity to interact with experts, but there are also recorded modules that you can listen to at your convenience and, and watch. You can also get a mentor. Um, and this would be, uh, again, this is sort of targeted at providers and prescribers, but we all know that we work in teams. So if you're a part of a team that is tr pro uh, trying to provide safe and appropriate opioids, uh, prescribing for pain relief or MAT, I would suggest that you access this resource um, because it's really not just about the prescriber and the prescription itself. Now, even though I said that, the next one's called opioidprescribing.com, and this is a SAMHSA-funded uh, activity that has some really, really nice, well-done modules that with some video components with actors. And this can be particularly helpful in trying to explain to support staff and clinic staff and program people and system people what exactly is the doctor in there doing or the nurse practitioner in there doing. And there's a particularly good module that talks about how do you deal with uh, finding something in your prescription drug monitoring program that maybe your patient didn't disclose. And how, how do you how do you share that information with the individual and address it in a therapeutic and clinically appropriate way. So that's, I think, um, something I, I, that I'd like to draw your attention to. Now, for help with naloxone co-prescribing, and I say co-prescribing because we sort of framed it initially as you give this to somebody who's on an opiate for pain so that it's in their house, they have an antidote to poisoning should it occur. But we also need to be prescribing naloxone to drug users. Um, drug users are at very high risk of death, but also they're very likely to be on the scene if another drug user were to accidentally overdose on an opioid. So having it in, in such a person's hand um, goes a long way for saving life. Now, we, the, the naloxone prescribing uh, information, you can actually access it on opioidprescribing.com or prescribe to prevent. And then I wanted to point out uh, integration.gov which is a HRSA SAMHSA collaborative website. And um, there are some collaborative learning communities that, that interact through that website. But it's a great place to find information about behavioral health in the general medical setting, addiction treatment in the behavioral health setting, and the whole mix of that. Um, now, I think go to the next slide. This should be um, the, the last real, uh-oh, back up one. I think we might have, oh, well, so one slide, I think I sent you an update that had an additional slide in here, so I'll just tell you about it. Um, we have a live training taking place in New Mexico, in um, Albuquerque, August 15th. It's um, the New Mexico Hispanic Medical Association, Perspectives in Minority Health, and they're calling it Emerging Treatment Options for Pain and Addiction. Um, I can, um, I'll provide a link for the organizers here so that you can check that out. We are also planning um, an another live training in Arizona uh, before the end of the year, but I don't have dates to that one yet. So um, uh, check with the, the webinar organizers for a link for this New Mexico Hispanic Medical Association uh, Emerging Treatment Options for Pain and Addiction training. And um, that's the total of my comments for you today. I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the webinar and uh, being available for questions should there be any. Thank you. Hello, this is Chris Stock. Uh, while well, the slides are changing, oh, there they are, great. Uh, Dr. Campampiano and, and Dr. Hobson both mentioned, uh, and, and I believe Dr. Smith all mentioned naloxone, and I'll just put in a plug at this point before I, I start on mine. And Dr. Campampiano also mentioned the uh, Providers Clinical Support System, PCSSO. For any pharmacists who are in the audience, PCSSO is sponsoring a how-to webinar on August 13th to assist you as a pharmacist in initiating distribution of naloxone in your own practice and within your community. So go to that website.
website and sign up for that if you're a pharmacist. Um, so I am going to describe the physiology of opioids as uh, the previous speakers have given such an excellent introduction to why this has become uh, a, a problem. And so I hope that describing the physiology of op opioids will provide you with a way of understanding why opioid use has progressed to the epidemic level that it has and is accompanied by the devastation of addiction and of deaths, including deaths of people not known to have opioid addiction. So go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what are opioids? Opioids represent the top tier of pain relief medications. There is nothing else that um, doctors use and that pharmacists prescribe in, in routine practice that treats pain uh, any more powerfully than uh, opioid medications do. And they do this because they work both in the pain and the spinal cord. Uh, they block pain uh, sensations being delivered to the brain, and they affect the, the reactions that would be, uh, the messages that would be sent down to, to react to pain. So uh, they're numbing medications. Uh, and as I mentioned, they're the top tier of pain medications. They work better, uh, more powerfully, and certainly in a different way than uh, aspirin, ibuprofen, uh, acetaminophen, or any of the other um, uh, non-addicting medications. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time and talk about the pharmacology of opioids, including a, a brief discussion of the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics, and the pharmacogenomics. Again, all in an effort to understand how we have gotten to this epidemic um, level of opioid use and overdose death. So pharmacokinetics in, includes these four parameters, um, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. And so for all of the opioids, we have to think about um, the different formulations that they come in, whether they're sustained release or regular release, whether they're uh, tablets, sublingual, injectable, whether people are using them as directed and taking the tablets or uh, the medication under the tongue, like with uh, buprenorphine uh, formulations or whether they're abusing it and crushing it, smoking it, injecting it. Um, and smoking and injecting end up being the fastest, um, being the routes of administration that result in the fastest onset of action. Then, of course, we have to think about once the drug is in the bloodstream, how is it distributed to the place where it has, has its action? And the epidemic of opioid use and, and misuse and death that we're talking about are a result of opioids being distributed to mu opioid receptors in the brain area. There are mu, um, mu opioid receptors and other opioid receptors in other parts of the body, but it's the mu opioid receptors in, in the brain that are, are really the target of distribution and um, the, have the impact that, that we're seeing with this epidemic of use. Um, then opioids are metabolized, mostly in, in the liver, and in that process we have to think about what opioid it is, what it turns into, how quickly that occurs. And then finally, the final step in, involved in this process of pharmacokinetics is excretion. How do the, does the drug get out of the body? And so when we think about opioids, we, um, and, and especially with op opioids that um, have a stronger potential to lead to uh, people developing opioid use disorder, um, otherwise what we think of as addiction, we think about um, drugs that are rapidly absorbed and get out of the body very fast. We have to take a minute, though, to think about what happens in the brain 
And as I mentioned, the, the distribution point is getting those opioids to uh, the brain where they will bind to mu opioid receptors. And there are characteristics of, of each of the opioids. The characteristics that are important in their, in their action and in what we see as a result are affinity. Affinity represents how strongly they bind to the receptor. Specificity, meaning how well they fit the receptor and are, are able to activate it. And then we have characteristics. Most of the, the medications and the drugs that are used, opioids, are we call them agonists. They activate the receptors. But we do have antagonists. And uh, you've heard naloxone t referred to several times. So naloxone is an antagonist. It blocks the mu opioid receptor because it has very strong affinity for it, but it doesn't activate it. It, it sits on the receptor and has no action. So because of the affinity, it will remove any opioids that are there. And that's why it's so useful in the event of a, an overdose. So mu opioid receptors have these four properties. And when they're activated, they produce analgesia, that relief of pain. But the mu opioid receptor, when activated, also creates this sensation that, that someone using will often describe as a feeling of euphoria. That same receptor is also responsible for respiratory depression. So there's less response to uh, uh, carbon dioxide. And it's also the, the receptor, when activated, that's most responsible for the end result of the behavioral disorder that, that we call addiction or opioid use disorder. And as I mentioned, there are other opiate receptors but they really have um, a minimal or no role specifically in, in all of the actions that we're seeing and why we use opioids and in, in what the end result is. So we're primarily focused on the mu opioid receptor and what its actions are. So what are the actions when the mu, the, the clinical effects when the mu opioid receptor is activated there is analgesia or suppression of pain. The pupils constrict and the, um, in response to the dose. So higher doses, you'll end up with pinpoint pupils. I'll move on to the, the other things um, that are in black print, constipation, cough suppression, lax muscle tone, dry mouth. And then as I mentioned before, you activate mu opioid receptors and many people would, will describe euphoria. So there are, those are all effects. In addition, the ones that are potentially lethal are lowering heart rate, lowered blood pressure, and of course, lowered respiratory drive. If you take opioids away and, and uh, opioid, the mu opioid receptor is no longer activated after someone has, has had opioids on those receptors for a period of time, pain will return, the pupils will, will dilate, the heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory drive will, will increase. The person will experience diarrhea, cough, tight muscle tone and twitching, salivation, lacrimation, runny nose. And in the red, the big thing that drives people to con continue using opioids, even though they know that, that uh, things are bad for them in many areas of their life, is that they feel so terrible that nothing will relieve that feeling of, of feeling terrible except returning to opioid use. So getting back to the, the uh, principles of pharmacokinetics helps us understand and explain why they get hooked. So if you can see in uh, uh, highlighted by the red arrows and the, the red boxes and circles, the things that, that um, are the most highly uh, abused or misused opioids. And if you look at the time to peak when they are used either orally or by injection, um, and then look at their half-life, they have a rapid onset of action or a short time to peak, and they have a short half-life or a short duration of action. So those are the drugs that are highly misused. What about med medication-assisted treatment? How are methadone and buprenorphine, even though they are opioid agonists, how are they different? 
they're different because they have a very prolonged time to peak compared to the drugs that are highly misused. And they have a very long half-life. And what this means in the brain when the opioid, new opioid receptor is activated is that they're much less reinforcing. So now let's talk about the withdrawal aspect, also to, to help um, understand why they get hooked. If you look at the onset of withdrawal, when withdrawal peaks and how, withdrawal, how long withdrawal lasts, again, the, the red stars are highlighting those drugs that are, are highly abused or misused. And the green stars highlight those medications, those opioids that are used in medication-assisted treatment. And you can see that the onset of withdrawal and the peak effects of withdrawal occur very, very quickly after the individual's last use with those drugs that are highly misused. Whereas with methadone and buprenorphine, also opioid agonists, their onset of withdrawal and the peak effects of, of withdrawal are, are quite prolonged after the individual has used their last dose. So any withdrawal effects will be lower in intensity and, and less pronounced. I think it's also important to, to talk about pharmacogenomics, because if we just look at pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, anybody who uses opioids might get hooked if they're using opioids that are rapidly absorbed and quickly eliminated. But I think pharmacogenomics help us understand why not everybody who uses gets hooked. So pharmacogenomics helps us understand why we have this understanding. We know that opioid use disorder, opioid addiction, is not a musculoskeletal disorder. It's a brain disorder. And not everybody who uses gets hooked. But we do know that a large percent of people who, do, who use do. So this is data from the National Household Survey that um, SAMHSA publishes and, and updates. Uh, this is data from 2012, but it's very similar over the, the years that this survey has been done. So of the population in the United States, 11 million people um, are opioid users, but about 2 million of them meet the criteria for opioid use disorder. That's about 18 percent and is significantly higher than what we see with other drugs um, other commonly used drugs like alcohol and uh, uh, cannabinoids, uh, marijuana. So the, the pathways that, that lead an individual toward opioid use disorder or addiction include biological, psychological, social, and spiritual. But I believe that all of these have a, an inseparable connection, which is how, how do genes uh, affect who develops addiction and who doesn't. This is from a study published in, uh, a paper published in 2009, and just gives some idea of, of the heritability of various addictions. You can see on the uh, left-hand uh, bar of the graph, that's the, the heritability range in a, a percent. And along the bottom are various um, agents that are listed, and you can see that there is some heritability for the, the few individuals that might develop a, a hallucinogen use disorder. But as you move over to the right-hand side of the graph, you see alcohol with uh, an increased risk of uh, uh, occurring that, that's heritable. But you can then move further over to the right and see opiates and cocaine having very high heritability. So that's part of the pharmacogenomics picture. So the picture you put together then is combining the drug and combining the, the genes or the heritability that an individual might have and their particular uh, social and psychological and, and physical environment. And when you combine those th three things, then you get a phenotype whatever kind of disorder is, is expressed. So if an individual doesn't use a drug, for instance, they're not going to develop a, a drug use disorder. But if they use that drug and they have genes that put them at risk for developing a use disorder, 
and they're using in an environment that is creating some stress. They are a significant risk for developing a, a use disorder. So just to, to uh, give examples of that, increased drug use by itself will produce neurochemical changes that support addiction. The uh, inherited factors, the, the genes that are inherited may uh, provide neurochemical systems that support addiction that, that are inherited. And then lastly, the environment There it is coming up. The environment, their personal, home, school, cultural, or societal environment may increase stress that produces neurochemical changes that support addiction. And so that addiction is partly at least a result of act activation of the reward pathway by drugs such as heroin, morphine, oxycodone, uh, other opioids. And so we know that opioid use disorder occurs in, in people and, and the uh, manifestations are that they seek opioids most of the time. They continue to use in spite of experiencing terrible consequences in their life. They deny that there's a problem. They have a strong tendency to relapse. They've lost control and have altered brain chemistry. So a way of understanding that loss of control is they may be able to, to choose whether to initiate the use of the drug or not. It's not a spastic elbow, uh, but once they decide to use, the loss of control that they experience is they can't control, they, they don't know what's going to happen uh, and what the consequences will be each time they use. So to, to change gears just a little bit, you've heard this before, the, the death toll um, that has resulted from uh, prescription opioid use, that over 16,000 people um, dying each year, um, almost two deaths an hour. Um, I'm speaking to you from Utah. We have one of the highest rates of um, uh, prescription overdose death here. I happen to work in the, the VA um, healthcare system as well, and unfortunately Utah has the highest rate of overdose death among veterans of, of all of the states. So this is, hits uh, very closely home, home for me and other people. So how do those deaths occur? They result from the opioid-induced respiratory depression that I referred to earlier. So mu opioid receptor activation um, numbs the carbon dioxide response, which is usually is responsible for driving uh, respirations. So when there are opioids on board, the brain is not as responsive to carbon dioxide. And so you can see on this graph working from uh, left to right that if you have uh, uh, agonists on the mu opioid receptor, you may have respiratory depression if you go all the way over the right and you put an antagonist on that receptor, it removes the agonist, it produces no signal, and the respiratory depression that was previously produced is reversed. The person starts breathing again. Finally, I'll just show you, other, other presenters have, have talked about this, but if you're not familiar, these are the products that um, are available on the left, the Evzio is the current um, FDA-approved product for take-home use. The products that are shown over on the right are FDA-approved products, the naloxone um, uh, by, for injection, but the, the, uh, putting it into a form that uh, can be uh, used by bystanders or lay people um, is what's occurring in uh, community programs that Dr. Campampiano described. So um, as Dr. Campampiano mentioned, there's a, a great push to expand access to naloxone. These are among the, the agencies. Um, she also mentioned that she's hopeful that she will soon be able to revise the opioid overdose toolkit that, that you see on this slide and include some FDA-approved intranasal um, delivery devices, and, and I'm certainly very much looking forward to that and think that that would be an excellent addition. 
So I think at this point, um, uh, are we opening it up to questions? And uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Stock, and uh, definitely look forward to um, more conversation on the topics that you've raised and really help stimulate the, the group. We are at the end of our presentation time, but I very quickly wanted to let you all know that we have uh, four upcoming webinars at the same uh, day of the week as well as the same time. Uh, next Wednesday, July 29th, we'll be talking about clinical assessments uh, and the role that clinical assessment plays in our um, primary care as well as hospital practices. Uh, we'll, on August 5th, we'll be talking about appropriate opioid prescribing. On August 12th, we'll be talking about treating addiction. Uh, and then on the 19th, we'll be revisiting many of the points that Dr. Stock had raised and talking about overdose uh, intervention as well as drug disposal strategies. Um, as we had indicated, we will be um, managing um, questions, if you have any, by email. Uh, and we look forward to having you as well as all of your colleagues to be able to join our uh, webinar next week. Thank you very much, and we'll be ending the webinar at this time.